without you, we can do nothing, but with you, all things are possible. As the university hosts this 2023 GBA annual conference, may it be a mountaintop experience when instead of looking back upon the values of the past, we look forward to greater heights to be scaled. We pray for your protection and direction for this conference. May your presence be felt amongst us as we go through this conference. This and many others we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend. His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana, um, colleague, due to pressing national matters, the program will have to be tweaked. And in that regard, the President of the Republic of Ghana will address us first. So at this juncture, may I respectfully invite His Excellency the President of the Republic of Ghana, Nana Adodankwa Kufuado, to give us his remarks. Thank you. Chief Justice, Central Regional Minister, the Deputy Chief of Staff in the Office of the President and officials of the Presidency, Attorney General, Ministers, Deputy Ministers of State, the Justices of the Supreme Court and other Justices of the Superior Court of Judicature, Judges, Members of the Judicial Council, Judicial Secretary, President and members of the, Ghana Bar, of the Bar Council of the Ghana Bar Association, members of the Ghana Bar Association, the Omahini of Cape Coast, of Sabarim Makwisiata, and other traditional rulers, fellow Ghanaians, ladies and gentlemen. I'm grateful to the Bar Council for the opportunity and the invitation to address this year's Bar Conference my seventh time of doing so as President of the Republic. I'm aware that it is a privilege which I'll continue not to abuse. Before I touch on the theme of this year's conference, ensuring high standards and integrity in public life, the role of the legal profession, I want to place on record my appreciation once again to the Council for making me a member in permanent good standing. <laughs> I.e. one who does not have to pay dues. <laughs> it is an enviable status, one which I cherish. I'm also very grateful to the President and members of the Council for rearranging today's, today's program that in a manner that allows me to fulfill other important engagements of the day. It means, unfortunately, that I will not be able to enjoy the fellowship of the traditional lunch after this ceremony, which allows all of us to break bread together. God willing, next year, we'll resume the fellowship. As I continue to be extremely proud 
of my membership of this association, which has been and continues to be so devoted to advancing the public interest of our nation. Now, my friends, I come from a background where public service is considered a duty and where privilege and good fortune demand even greater commitment to the common good. Generations of my forebears and relations established this rich tradition of public service to which I am greatly indebted as it is a source of constant inspiration. Indeed, Kufi Abrifa Busia, Prime Minister of the Progress Party Government of the Second Republic, and one of the great Ghanaians, said in these pregnant words, and I quote, we regard politics as an avenue of service to our fellow men. We hold that political power is to be exercised to make life nobler and happier, unquote. I'm fully aware of the responsibility the job of President of the Republic brings. It's unfortunate enough to carry a sense of the history and struggles that made that job, that job possible, as well as being apprised of the challenges and opportunities of the future. Crucial to the progressive and prosperous future I seek to help create for the Ghanaian people is how to sustain their confidence in the democratic journey on which we have embarked. We celebrated this year 30 years of multi-party democracy under the Constitution of the Fourth Republic, which has provided the framework for the longest period of uninterrupted, stable constitutional governance in our otherwise turbulent history. Next year, we will be going to the polls for the ninth time in the Fourth Republic to elect a new president and new members of parliament. We will, in the results of those polls, witness either the changing of power from one political party to another, as we have done on three separate occasions in the Fourth Republic, or the breaking of the eight, <laughs> something that has never happened before in the Fourth Republic. I'm sure I do not need to tell you what my present preference is. It is public knowledge. What is important, however, is that the Ghanaian people have demonstrated that they are fully conversant with the process of peaceful democratic transitions and need no lessons in the exercise of their democratic rights. Maintaining high standards and integrity in public, public life is key to extending our association with multi-party democracy. As one writer put it, and I quote, standards in public life help to maintain the health of the democratic system and uphold public confidence in it. They help prevent politicians and officials from being swayed by outside interests in their decision making and help to maintain a political culture that fosters open and constructive debate. They thereby contribute to a political system that is fair, inclusive, stable, and effective." Unquote. The Ghanaian people are expectant that Parliament, the legislative arm of government, will continue to grow into its proper role as an effective machinery for accountability and oversight of the executive, and not be its junior partner. Parliament must stand out as an institution that represents all the values that we hold dear and in which our citizens can take pride. Our judiciary must inspire confidence in the citizenry so we can all see the courts as the ultimate arbiters when disputes arise. A Ghanaian judge must be a reassuring presence and the epitome of fairness. Ensuring high standards and integrity in public life has its own impact on the image of our nation and our ability to attract the substantial amounts of investment, foreign and domestic, 
needed to help grow our economy. We will attract the requisite investments if we continue to hold ourselves as a haven of peace, security, and stability. And if we continue to show that we are a country where the separation of powers is real and the principles of democratic accountability and respect for the rule of law, individual liberties and human rights are firmly entrenched in our body politic. The legal profession has a catalytic role to play in guaranteeing the sustenance of these values and thereby in helping us uphold the maintenance of integrity in the ordering of our state. Leonard friends, in recent times, the debate on standards and integrity in public life has centered largely on the fight against corruption and whether or not this president and his government are doing enough to combat this cancer. It is true that corruption is not an exclusively Ghanaian phenomenon, but one which permits all nations of the world. It results in reputational damage to businesses and establishments and undermines the public trust in governments. The manifestations of corruption are getting increasingly complex as they often occur with the aid of professional enablers such as accountants, lawyers, bankers, real estate agents, shell companies, and opaque financial systems that provide opportunities for the laundering and concealment of illicit wealth. If not controlled, corruption can stultify the economic aspirations of any nation. Globally, the World Economic Forum has estimated the cost of corruption around the world at some 2.6 trillion United States dollars a year. I accepted the invitation to speak here in order to take advantage of this occasion, to place again, once again, my government's record on corruption for public scrutiny. It will show that my government has undertaken arguably the boldest initiative since our nation attended independence nearly 66 years ago, to reform and strengthen the, cap the capacity of our institutions to tackle corruption in the public sector. Charity, they say, begins at home. And that is why so far, every single alleged act of corruption leveled against any of my appointees has been investigated by independent bodies, such as SHRAD, the CID, and in some cases by Parliament itself. It is not my job to clear or convict any person accused of wrongdoing or of engaging in acts of corruption. That is the job of the courts and the law enforcement agencies. My job is to act on allegations of corruption by referring the issue or issues to the proper investigative agencies for the relevant inquiry and action, including, if necessary, the suspension of the affected official pending the conclusion of investigations. That is exactly what has been done since I assumed the mantle of leadership on 7 January 2017. From the allegations against the then Minister-designate for Energy, Boache Jaco, at his parliamentary confirmation hearings in 2017, to that against the former CEO of BOSS, the Honorable Alfred Obeng, to those against the, the, the then two Deputy Chiefs of Staff at the Office of the President, Honorable Francis Asensu Bwache and Honorable Samuel Abujinapo, to the conflict of interest allegations against the Minister for Finance, Keno Furiata, to the claims of extortion against the then Trade and Industry Minister-designate, Alan Chemateng at his parliamentary confirmation hearings in 2017, to allegations of doubling in visa racketeering against the then Deputy Minister for Youth and Sports, Pius Hajije, and the then Di Director General of the National Sports Authority, the Honorable Robert Safo Mensah, who even though exonerated by the CID, later resigned. 
The chairperson of the board of the National Sports Authority, the Honorable Kujuba Ajiman. To the allegations of bribery leveled against the secretary to the Interministerial Committee on Illegal Mining, Charles Bissu. To those involving the dismissed acting CEO of the Public Procurement Authority, PPA, ABAJ, and the dismissed CEO of the National Youth Authority, Emmanuel Asigure. They have all been investigated, and in most cases, cleared by the authorized institutions of the state, and not by President Akufo Addo. <laughs> the latest episode, the latest episode involving the former Minister for Sanitation and Water Resources, the Honorable Cecilia Abnadapa, is evident for all to see. I am not aware of any government in the Fourth Republic subjecting so many of its officials to such investigations and inquiries. At the same time, several officials of the previous Mahama administration, such as William Matthew Tevi, Al-Haji Salifu Mimina Osman, and Eugene Bafoboni in the infamous four United States million NC dollars NCA scandal have been tried and convicted of various corruption-related offenses. And several others, including Dr. Stephen Upuni, the former CEO of Cocoa Board, and the Honorable Cassiel Atuforsen, the minority leader in Parliament, are standing trial as we speak. None of the accountability institutions of state, including the new Office of Special Prosecutor, have ever indicated any pressure from the executive over their investigations. There are some who refuse to accept my method of proceeding and have characterized me as a clearing agent. <laughs> because for them, the mere allegation without more is enough to merit condemnation of the public official. For my part, I will not set aside due process in the fight against corruption, no matter how much opprobrium, no matter how much opprobrium this incurs for me. With a clear understanding that corruption thrives in an atmosphere conducive to its inconcealment, and that access to information is a vital tool in the fight against corruption. My government in its first term ensured the passage of the Right to Information Act 2019, Act 989, in order to give true meaning and effect to the provisions of Article 21, Clause 1, Subclause F of the Constitution. The Act, which successive governments had failed to pass, Seized to the implementation of the constitutional right to information held by a public institution to foster a culture of transparency and accountability in public affairs subject to exemptions necessary and consistent with the protection of the public interest in a democracy, in a democratic society. The Act is being implemented fully now with the governing board chaired by an experienced retired High Court judge. The Ministry of Information has trained information officers in various ministries, departments, and agencies of government to support the full application of the law. In 2018, again during my first term, Parliament passed the Witness Protection Act 2018, Act 975, to which I gave assent on 24th August the same year. The Act established a witness protection agency to establish a witness protection scheme as a vehicle for offering protection to persons who are required to cooperate with law enforcement agencies as witnesses in the investigation and prosecution of cases, particularly corruption cases affecting public officers. The Criminal Offenses Amendment Act 2020 Act 1034 has been passed to amend Section 239 of the Criminal Offenses Act to, to categorize the offense of corruption 
previously a misdemeanor as a felony and to provide stiffer, stiffer punishments of terms of imprisonment of not less than 12 years and not more than 25 years in prison. Other laws passed by Parliament at the instigation of my administration and which have enhanced significantly the capacity of the state in the fight against corruption are the Revenue Administration Amendment Act 2020, Act 1029, the Fiscal Responsibility Act 2018, 982, State Interest and Governance Authority Act 2019, Act 990, the Anti-Money Laundering Act 2020, Act 1044, the Corporate Restructuring and Insolvency Act 2020, Act 1015, the Companies Act 2019, Act 992, including its provisions on the register of beneficial owners. The Narcotics Control Commission Act of 2020, Act 1019, and the Real Estate Agency Act 2020, Act 1047. Administratively, a series of other far-reaching measures have been undertaken by my government to help in the fight against corruption. A memorandum of understanding on information exchange and collaboration in combating corruption and crime in general has been signed by Shraj, Eyoko, Parliament, Office of the Attorney General, Ghana Audit Service, Ghana Police Service, Financial Intelligence Center, the Narcotics Control Commission, the Internal Audit Agency, the National Investigations Bureau, NIB, and the Office of the Special Prosecutor to this end. Underlying the digitalization agenda of my government, which comprises a robust national identification system, digital property address system, the paperless port system, e-justice system, pensions and insurance data system, a digitalized land registry, and mobile money interoperability, is the overarching objective to improve transparency, accountability, and efficiency in the public sector. A digitized invest environment ultimately helps to eliminate and prevent corruption in various institutions and agencies. The passport office, ports and harbors, registrar general's department, the national health insurance scheme, the driver vehicle and licensing authority, which hitherto were fertile grounds for corrupt activity, are being transformed beyond recognition. The introduction of the Ghana.gov platform has significantly reduced the risk of public sector corruption through embezzlement, making it possible for services to be accessed and payments made online by card or mobile money, with a considerable reduction in the conduit of middlemen or Godo boys. It is also an undeniable fact the budgetary allocations for institutions actively engaged in public sector accountability, i.e. the Office of the Auditor General, the Judiciary, Parliament, the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice Raj, the Ghana Police Service, the Economic and Organized Crimes Office, IOCO, and the Financial Intelligence Center, FIC, have witnessed unprecedented increase since I assumed office in 2017. At the end of 2022, the budgetary allocation to Parliament witnessed a 100% increase compared to what I inherited in 2016. The police saw its budget increase by 274% at the end of 2022 in comparison to 2016. The audit service recorded a 258% rise in its budgetary allocation at the end of 2022 as compared to 2016. The budget of the judiciary rose by 36% at the end of 2022 compared to 2016. The budget of the Office of the Attorney General increased by 162% at the end of 2022 compared to 2016. The budget of Ayoko increased by 47% at the end of 2022 in comparison to 2016. 
The budget of the Financial Intelligence Center, FIC, increased by 443% compared to 2016, while the budget of SRAJ increased by 99% at the end of 2022 compared to 2016. These figures reflect my resolve to ensure that institutions of state of relevance in the anti-corruption agenda are properly equipped to discharge satisfactorily the mandate of their offices. In the area of investigations and prosecution of corruption and corruption-related offenses, a distinct innovation was undertaken by my administration in 2017 with a decision to set up an Office of Special Prosecutor through the passage of the Office of Special Prosecutor Act 2017, Act 959. The establishment of the Office of Special Prosecutor represents the most courageous measure by any government in the Fourth Republic to prosecute corruption in the executive arm of government. The monopoly of prosecutorial authority by an attorney general hired or fired by a president had been identified by some as a key factor allegedly standing in the way of law enforcement and prosecution as a credible tool in the fight against corruption before 2017. Even though the president appoints a special prosecutor, the president cannot unilaterally, unlike in the case of the attorney general, remove the special prosecutor from office. Article 15 of Act 959 vest the power to remove the special prosecutor in a committee established by the Chief Justice with the President acting only in accordance with the recommendations of the committee. His or her independence of the President is thereby assured. Leonard friends, inasmuch as public officials are required to declare their assets upon taking office as a tool of fighting corruption, a constitutional requirement which has been fulfilled by virtually all officials of both my administrations. I am, however, of the candid opinion that existing legislation on corruption relating to the conduct of public officers in Ghana appears to be inadequate to deal extensively with public office accountability. The need to lay down a set of far-reaching and a more fit-for-purpose set of regulations for the conduct of public officers, which will give effect to the provisions of Chapter 24 of the Constitution on conduct of public officers, is in my view now self-evident. The Attorney General, on behalf of government, is leading the effort to enact a law on the conduct of public officers. He has undertaken various stakeholder consultations with a number of public sector organizations, civil society, and other interest groups to this end. When passed into law, the Conduct of Public Officers Act will follow the example of legislations in other jurisdictions, like the United States Ethics in Government Act of 1978, the Public Officers Ethics Act of Kenya of 2003, and the UK Constitutional and Governance Act of 2010. In addressing issues regarding financial portfolios held by public officers before assuming public office, links to family business, improper enrichment, care of public property, professional practices, property, investments, shareholdings, and other assets, self-dealing, partiality in the performance of duties, use of public or confidential information to further pr private interest, amongst others. The bill will provide a gamut of stringent administrative measures and sanctions to deal with violations of the law, ranging from the bar against holding public office for limited and indefinite periods to penal sanctions and measures. The bill will also seek to strengthen the role of Shraj in the investigation of allegations of contravention of or non-compliance with the Code of Conduct for Public Officers, including conflict of interest, non-declaration of assets, and illicit enrichment. The Attorney General will bring the bill soon for the consideration of Cabinet 
and subsequent enactment by Parliament upon the conclusion of his consultations. What I have done here is to show you that my government has fought in this fighting corruption, not just in high sounding words, but actually in concrete deeds. We have shunned mere exhortations and showy denunciations of unproved corruption. It has been a holistic approach. We have made institutional reforms, we have enacted additional requisite laws, and we have resourced more adequately the accountability organs of state. Our fight against corruption has been grounded on le legislative, financial, and institutional action, and not on mere lip service. I can assure you that the fight to enhance standards and integrity in public life will continue under the Akufuado government. We will enforce the law no matter who's affected, because it is a necessary foundation for the successful fight against corruption and for guaranteeing integrity in public life. The law must truly be no respecter of persons. Now, my friends, I know that in some common law countries, particularly in the United States of America, the political color of judges is a legitimate top, top topic of public discourse. Indeed, justices at the district and state levels within the federal structure of the American government are elected officials. And even though judges at the federal level, including those of the Federal Court of Appeals and the United States Supreme Court, are appointed by the president with the consent of the Senate, their political coloring is generally well known and accepted. Historically, this has not been the case in Ghana, largely because of the critical controlling role of the Judicial Council, a nonpartisan body chaired by the Chief Justice, in the process of judicial appointments. It has meant that judicial appointments are conducted essentially on the basis of professional merit and suitability. Appointments to the lower courts, the High Court, and the Court of Appeal are done by the President exclusively on the advice of the Judicial Council. In the case of appointments to the Supreme Court, because of its unique position in our judicial structure, there are the additional requirements of the consultation of the Council of State and the approval of Parliament. In the overwhelming number of cases of justices designate to the Supreme Court, that approval has been given on a bipartisan basis. You can count on the fingers of a hand the number of justices designate whose approval meant less than unanimous consent. I've gone into this matter in some detail because of a new concept that has been recently introduced into our public discourse by no less a public figure than the fourth president of the Fourth Republic, the perennial NDC presidential candidate, John Dramani Mahama. who has told the world that I have packed the courts with so-called MPP judges, and that one of the key purposes of a putative NDC victory in 2024 will be to enable him balance the courts with so-called NDC judges. Not only are these concepts of, quote, MPP and, quote, NDC judges new in our public discourse. They are also extremely dangerous and represent the most brazen attack on the independence of the judiciary by an allegedly responsible politician of the Fourth Republic. They provide another reason, if more were needed, why right-thinking citizens should ensure the defeat in 2024 of the man whom the first special prosecutor identified as government official number one in the still unresolved 
airport, airbus bribery scandal. I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute my thoughts to this. I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute my thoughts to this important conversation and to the deliberations on the theme of this conference. And I wish you a successful meeting in this historic city of Cape Coast, which, ho which housed the Gold Coast Supreme Court in which the first Chief Justice, Marshall C.J., sat. It is appropriate that it should be the venue to welcome to the Bar Conference, the latest Chief Justice of our history, the 15th the Chief Justice of Ghana. May God continue to bless the Ghana Bar Association and us all, and may God bless our homeland Ghana and make her great and strong. I thank you for your attention. We, shall we remain standing as the president? Bef Before the president leaves, I have been um, permitted to take some few group photographs so that members on the high table will kindly join His Excellency and I'll also invite Osa Berima to join to take the group photograph. Sorry? Okay, so please, members of the high table will escort the president and join us to continue the program.
easily be upstanding as the Honorable Chief Justice and members of the High Table join us. the Central Regional President of the Ghana Bar Association, Mr. Samuel Eduyeboa, to give us the welcome address. Your Ladyship, the Chief Justice, Gertrude, Araba Isaba Sakitokonu. Justices of the Superior Court of Judicature, the Honorable Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Godfrey Yabu Adami, Honorable Ministers of State, the Honorable Central Regional Minister I'm sure he's, she's just left with the president. Honorable members of parliament, MMDCs, his Lord Anglican Bishop of Cape Coast, members of the General, Liga, General Council of the Ghana Bar Association, the GBA National President, Yao Echampam Bwafu, past presidents of the GBA, Nana Nomna, Nana Himafu, the clergy, present, imams, distinguished members of our profession, and other professional bodies invited, members of the Fourth Estate, distinguished UCC guests here in present, led by the Vice Chancellor of the University of Competitive Choice. <laughs> Our hosts. Ladies and gentlemen, another legal year has come to an end, and we've gathered to give account of our stewardship as leaders and members of the Ghana Bar Association and to prepare for the next legal year. In my capacity as the president of the Central Regional Bar, and on behalf of members of the Central Regional Bar, I wish to emphasize our gratitude to the National Council for choosing this region to host this year's August Conference. Your Excellency, distinguished guests, members of the bar, let me take the opportunity to welcome our sweet mother, sister, and daughter, 
di number three in Ghana, the Chief Justice of our Republic. <laughs> Justice Gertrude Araba. <laughs> it's Araba Saki Tokonu to her first conference as the Chief Justice on the special occasion of her birthday. <laughs> Which for us today, today is her birthday. <laughs> it is our prayer that she has a very successful tenure in the envious position she now occupies. In welcoming you today, members of our profession, let me not deviate from the tradition of giving you some background information about the central region. Historically, the people of this region were the first to get in contact with the European explorers, traders, clergy, educators, before the rest of modern-day Ghana. And as we had the privilege of benefiting from some of the positives of the contact, as lawyers will no doubt be aware that law practice began in and around the Cape Coast Castle and the then government house, which still stands. It is therefore no wonder you produce a very brilliant son in the law practice, an educationist and author, John Mensah Sawa, the first African to be called to the English bar in 1887. Our gathering in Cape Coos, more or less, is a homecoming. The region has produced other prominent lawyers and judges including former chief justices, law professors, and other legal luminaries whose footsteps we are proud to be associated with. On this note, let me raise a side issue that has agitated not only lawyers and judges in this region, but all persons who have had the benefit of visiting the Cape Coast court complex built in the Kutu Achampong region and commissioned in 1976, but now a death trap working to cause negative headlines in our media. The complex is in serious state of disrepair. Promises given over the years have not been fulfilled. Acquired land for a new complex is lying in a prime area of the Akra Takrade Highway, opposite Adisada College, the alma mater of the leader of the bar. <laughs> Our prayer is that something concrete is done to replace the existing complex. There are 12 high courts seven circuit courts, 24 district courts spread across the region. The central region is often referred to correctly as the mecca of education in Ghana. Cape Coast alone has 12 second circuit institutions in spite of the fact that it is not a very big capital town. The region has three public universities and two private universities, running all the privileged courses from law through medicine, engineering, to computer science and the humanities, with nearly 100,000 students undergoing regular courses, distance education, sandwich and weekend courses every year. 
our second circuit schools have a long standing historical record of excellent output in moral and academic achievements. Ghanaians from all parts of the country strive to be enrolled in the second circuit schools, which have produced lots of national achievers over the years. Because formal education started in the castles and communities along the coast, you only have to enjoy the Cape Coast fancy, which is spoken spice with English. While in town, do not be surprised to hear English spoken by some old ladies while speaking the fancy. We like to look European in Cape Coast. The central region has a population of about 3 million people with a small female majority over males, spread over the 9,826 square kilometers. And uh, most of our people are engaged in farming, fishing, trading, and mining. Nature has gifted us with good soil, the sea, and rivers, which are now mostly polluted in the western part of the region, but still good in the eastern side. And we have minerals especially good. Cash crops like cocoa, oil palm, coconut, pineapples, rubber, citrus are found across our region and we still have some forest reserves. Investors in agriculture will find opportunities exist in central region. Tourism facilities and events exist with rich historical background. Between July and September each year, a lot of festivals are celebrated depicting the culture and history of the people of this region. We are basically Fantis, Chi, and Guan, with migrant communities along the coast in the typical farming areas. We unfortunately missed the fatal affair of the chiefs and people of Ogwa whose celebration was climaxed only yesterday. There are other festivals which are peculiar to only Central Region and celebrated every year as among the Efutus, that's Winneba, where the two warrior groups compete in catching a live deer in a forest reserve, as well as the Ahoba Festival of part of the Fanti area, which is celebrated for the life and death of Ejaho, a man who gave himself to be sacrificed in pacification rituals against a pandemic that was killing a lot of the people. Kindly find time to join us in any of the celebrations and experience the rich culture of our region. Our region has perhaps the biggest palace in Ghana. And the Omahine of that area is a lawyer. You may be privileged to find time to go to Asim Kushia. On the political front, the region is divided into 20 and 23 constituencies. The region is the birthplace of colonial rule. And indeed, agitation against colonial rule also started here, with groups founded by the indigents and later joined by others from outside the region. In 1897, John Major Tava, together with J.W. de Graff Johnson, Jacob Osinse, J.P. Brown, and J.E. Kesleyford co-founded the Aborigines Rights Protection Society, which led organized and sustained opposition 
against the colonial government and lay the foundation for our fight for independence. Cape Coast was the capital of the Gold Coast until it moved to Accra in 1877. The Central Region continues to play its significant and leading role in this great country of ours. It is therefore with pride and privilege that we welcome you all to this year's conference, and it is our prayer that you will enjoy your stay whilst you are here. You are all welcome, Yamahona Kawa. Thank you, the Central Regional Bar President. May I now humbly invite the Honorable Attorney General and Minister of Justice and the official leader of the bar, Fred Yabu Adame, to give us his address. Thank you very much. Good morning. Ladies and the Chief Justice, this is Gertrude Araba Esaba. Saki Tokonu, Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice of the Superior Court of Judicature, then guarded, retired Justices of the Supreme Court, Justices Amigache and Jones Victor Maulo, Doche, I greet you. <laughs> Honorable Ministers of State, Members of Parliament, the President of the Ghana Bar Association, Sayawa Champon Bafo, the President of the Central Regional Bar, Deputy Attorney General Afretia Yeboah, members of the Bar Council, Dogwahine Osaberi Makwisiata II, as a for the matter, eminent clergy, members of the Bar, the Assembly, ladies and gentlemen. And it is a delight to be in the company of colleagues at the bar. The bar conference presents that rare opportunity to meet fellow lawyers from different walks of life, from Bogatanga to Takrade, whether we practice in commerce or crime, and whether we work in a public service or private practice. It reinforces my conviction that fundamentally, we are one bar and a strong one at that. Since the last bar conference in whole, we have had a new Chief Justice in the person of Her Ladyship Justice, Araba Esaba Saki Tokono, the third woman to occupy the office and the 15th in the history of Ghana. I have no doubt that the repertoire of qualities, skills, and experience she possesses will place her in a position to continue the process of modernizing and transforming Ghana's judiciary. Congratulations, my lady. The bar of which I am the official leader is in full support of your tenure and I pledge the fullest cooperation of the Office of Attorney General and Minister of Justice for you as well. May God be your guide as we superintend justice delivery in our great republic. Keep course, and I think I must also extend a happy birthday to you. And indeed, if I had some sort of bouquet, would have arrived at your door. It's never too late in this regard. Keep course represents many of the good things in law practice. The first capital of the Gold Coast and the hometown of the first indigenous lawyer of our land, John Ben Sasaba. It is apt to say that Cape Coast is indeed the cradle of the law in Ghana. The first Supreme Court building is located a few miles away from this venue. And at this point, I may say that I'm aware of plans to construct a new high court premise, high court complex not too far away from Adisade College. As part of this government's agenda to deliver a set of modern and fit for purpose infrastructure for the judiciary throughout the country. Whilst not opposed to the idea of construction of a new high court complex for the people of Cape Coast, I am of the view that we should also renovate and preserve the significance of that beautiful edifice, which once housed our Supreme Court as a historical monument for Ghana's judiciary. (laughs) 
most occupants of the highest echelons of power in our legal profession, the offices of the Chief Justice and the Attorney General, had their secondary education in Cape Coast. Many a lawyer obtained some lettering from a Cape Coast high school. And I hope that lawyers gathered here will, in the course of the week, find time to undertake some outreach activity at their respective institutions. Personally, Cape Coast holds good sentiment for me as well. I did my primary education in Cape Coast, starting from class one at the Bersam Memorial Preparatory School and continuing all the way up to secondary level at Adisari College, where I was part of the last batch of both the ordinary and advanced level candidates in 1994 and 1996, respectively. And in talking about Cape Coast's contribution to the law, it is fitting to recall that the flame of Adisari burns bright. I understand. I understand the Wesley girls people fondly say quite rightly that they have produced the first three lady chief justices of Ghana. And congratulations, all three, that's good. But the record also shows, but the record also shows that before Chief Justice Georgina Wood, the three, three of the immediate last four chief justices, and I talk about Philip Edward Acha, Edward Kwame Redu, and George Kinsley Acha, were all at the project. <laughs> So indeed, the tree was blazed quite some time ago. And it's understandable why the new High Court will be located opposite Adisado. That is where the law is. <laughs> Colleagues, I was struck by the importance of the choice of theme by the bar for this year's conference, ensuring high standards and integrity in life, in public life, the role of the legal profession. It cannot be overstated that the legal profession indeed has a huge role to play in the setting of standards and integrity in public life. The law, which members of this profession practice, consists of a set system of rules by which a particular country or community regulates the actions of its members and which it may enforce by way of penalties. The bar, of course, has always had close links with public life. The history of the land on which we live has seen a very intimate dependence on the law. The acquisition of the Gold Coast by the British and the manner in which the British chose to regulate their relationship with the indigenous people depended on law. After independence, law continued to shape the policies and visions of successive governments, dreams and aspirations to the people. Every new administration has been ushered in by law. Even the military regimes that abrogated the constitution have been quick to put in place various military decrees to regulate their reigns as well as to formally abrogate the old constitutions. The political architecture of our country is a creation of the law. Ghana is built on a legal instrument, the Constitution, approved by a national referendum in April 1992. The election of the president every four years is always validated by the publication of a law, the constitutional instrument titled the Declaration of President-Elect Instrument. In driving home the preeminence of the law in the affairs of state, I cannot help but quote once again the immortal words of Justice Azukrab, former Chief Justice, at the time of the celebration of the centennial of the establishment of the Supreme Court in 1976. And it goes as follows. If our legal history has been eventful in this past century, we can only say that we have been lucky in the people of our nation who have been alive in every generation to match the grandeur of the events of the time. We have, in these past years, never needed a hero in the law to speak up for our people. It has been hateful to warn the imperial power to keep our land inviolate, a Mesa Saba to plead the people's cause in the highest councils of empire, a Kuse to guide in the writing of our first constitution towards independence, in our own lifetime, a Dankwa to keep us reminded of the need for legal self-discipline in the tumultuous years immediately after independence, and a Corsa to hold first among our people the skills of justice evenly between the government, the and the people, end of quote. Throughout much of the history of post-independence Ghana, there has been a shared culture between the bar and the higher reaches of government and the civil service. There has never been a gulf between the walls of law and politics. A very large number of practicing barristers have been members of the House of Parliament. The speakers of Parliament Ghana has had so far have been lawyers. The Fourth Republic has seen three of its five presidents so far being lawyers. Unfortunately, it looks like the next president will not be a lawyer. However, it is becoming increasingly quite clear that even though the next president will be an economist, being the son of a lawyer, <laughs> even though the next president, in my view, will definitely be a an economist, 
being the son of a lawyer, he will hold fast to the values the legal profession cherishes. If lawyers have played this prominent role in the building and development of our country, then their role in the maintenance of standards and the promotion of integrity in public life cannot be taken for granted. The significance of integrity is summed up in the famous words of former U.S. Senator Alan K. Simpson, and it goes as follows. If you have integrity, nothing else matters. If you do not have integrity, nothing else matters. End of quote. In this way, the importance and indispensability of integrity in every situation we find ourselves in as human beings, including our public life, is brought to the fore. As lawyers, the rules of our profession which bind us up the discharge of our five-fold duty to the client, the court, the opponent, to the lawyer's own self, and ultimately to the state, as stated by Lord Mark Miglan, a former Advocate General of Scotland and former member of the Court of Laws, are founded on integrity and place us in a position to ensure the maintenance of high standards in public life. Colleagues, in my respectful view, the legal profession, professional conduct and etiquette rules 2020, LI 24-23, is carefully designed to serve as a signpost for high standards and integrity in the public service for every lawyer. Rule 1 of LI 2423 says that the lawyer's duty to discharge his responsibilities to explain to the court, the public, and another lawyer honorably and with integrity. In the same rule, we find the lawyer's responsibility in view of the important role of the legal profession in a free democratic society to recognize the diversity of the Ghanaian community to protect the dignity of individuals and to respect human rights in force in the country. Rule 5 of LI 2423 teaches us that in the representation by a lawyer, that lawyer is, and I quote, a representative of a client, an officer of the legal system, and a public citizen with special responsibility for the level of quality justice, end of quote. Quite importantly, and I've often spoken about this, by dint of Rule 12, sub Rule 1, a lawyer is prohibited in the course of his professional practice from sending written co correspondence or communicating orally with another lawyer in a manner that is abusive, offensive, or inconsistent with the proper conduct of a professional communication from a lawyer. Rule 14, South Rule 2, further prohibits a lawyer from making a communication that is false or misleading if that communication amounts to a material misrepresentation of a fact or law. This really applies to lawyers who are constant users of or communicators on social media and the traditional media. It is abundantly clear from these rules that the age-old requirements of a profession, insofar as ethics is concerned, apply to lawyers on social media. Indeed, technology did not eradicate ethics. Rule 34 dictates that every lawyer shall make reasonable efforts to expedite litigation. As you can imagine, this is of interest to me. The considerably slow pace of justice delivery in Ghana hampers productivity and progress in many spheres of the nation's life. In accordance with Rule 34, it is the duty of every lawyer to expedite litigation. One of justice delivery, which requires urgent injection of expedition efficiency, is criminal justice. I have recently presented to Cabinet a criminal procedure amendment bill, which introduces a substantial reform of the criminal procedure laws of this country with the ultimate objective of enhancing the speed of education in criminal cases. The new measures proposed include scrapping trials on indictment, except where the offense is punishable by death or life imprisonment, as enshrined in the Constitution or other substantive law. Submission of witnesses by video conference, trials to proceed when an accused person is not personally present in court, day-to-day -day trial of all criminal cases, except where, where same is impracticable. Restriction on interlocutory appeals to only after a determination by the trial court of a submission of no case by the accused. Reform of the, the jury system to reduce the list of exemptions from jury service. And I think I must indicate that going forward, lawyers will serve as jurors. The composition of the jury by the introduction of the concept of alternate jurors Adoption of proceedings in criminal cases and many other matters. The bill underwent extensive stakeholder consultations prior to its presentation in cabinet, and I note with satisfaction that the Judicial Council and the Ghana Bar Association have approved of those far-reaching reforms of criminal procedure in Ghana. I'm hopeful that cabinet will deliberate on the same rapidly 
in order for it to be laid in Parliament when parliamentary sittings resume in October. Respectfully, at the heart of the legal profession are three commitments to independence, to excellence, and to advocacy. These three tenets, combined with the bar's high degree of tenacity, explain why the bar has survived in Ghana since 1876 and why, in my view, it will continue to survive and thrive. We should not take these things, these things for granted. The essential elements of a profession must be guarded against elements who seek to destroy same. Lawyers must fearlessly speak against tendencies which threaten the integrity of our profession. Fearlessness, indeed, is an age-old attribute of the good advocate. Rule 52 of LI 2423 specifically restrains lawyers from making statements which they know to be false or with reckless disregard for their falsity concerning the integrity of a judge, an adjudicative officer, or a public legal officer. Rule 61, paragraph B, subparagraph III, proceeds to further bar lawyers from engaging in conduct which diminishes confidence in the administration of justice. We cannot turn a blind eye to the reality that has become customary for some people, indeed it's an annual affair, to launch unwarranted attacks on the independence of the judiciary. If the source of the recent attacks on the independence of the judiciary is of concern, of even greater worry is a class of people who provide audience for such unwarranted comments to be made. The audience consisted of lawyers. It is worrying because, as I've stated before, lawyers ought to be the loudest and strongest defenders of the, of the independence, integrity, and importance of the judiciary, rather than serving as tools for its destruction. By their silence, they became abettors in the propagation of hate against the judiciary. For one to express the desire to appoint mainly members of one's political party to the judiciary, if given the mandate to govern the nation again, clearly indicates an unfamiliarity with the process of appointment of judges. Whilst acknowledging the constitutional duty of the president to appoint all judges in the country, it is imperative to note that the president does not appoint judges to any, country, to any court in a vacuum or in absolute power in that regard. Each appointment onto the judiciary is preceded first by an indication of a vacancy by the Judicial Council. Without a vacancy, the President cannot appoint. We cannot in this regard rule out the coincidence of situations. If a vacancy arises, it falls for whichever President is in office to formally fill the same by appointing after the exhaustion of all constitutionally mandated procedures. Thus, the notion that the President can just appoint any member, any number of judges that he desires in order to neutralize, in quote, the perceived declaration of the judiciary is incorrect and grossly misleading. Further, the participation of the Judicial Council as well as the Council of State and Parliament, where necessary, in the processes of appointing a judge stipulated in Article 144 of the Constitution, cannot be ignored. The President also does not have the power to empanel any court in the country. Respectfully, a consequence of the government's policy to expand and improve infrastructure of the judiciary through the construction of over 100 high court buildings around the country and the Court of Appeal Complex in Kumasi, which has 24 bedroom bungalows, has been the need to appoint and post judges to some of these courts. It may well be that the criticism the sitting president enjoys or receives from certain quarters for the alleged appointment of many judges to the Superior Court is a price the government is paying for improving access to justice and improving judicial infrastructure. It has perhaps become necessary to examine critically the number of appointments made onto the highest court of Ghana, the Supreme Court, since 2009. The record shows seven appointments to fill seven vacancies on the Supreme Court between 2009 and 2016. I take note that there have been 15 appointments to the Supreme Court between 2018 and 2023. However, a careful scrutiny of those appointments show, shows that they actually filled only six vacancies. Positions held by Justices Mar Fussell, Agnes Doji, Lina Megache, Professor Kote, and Clemens Holinyega, all of them being appointees for President Kufuado, became vacant in the course of the same president on account of either death or retirement. And indeed, another justice appointed by President Kufuado who also retired this year, Justice Maria Mowusu. With such vacancies, fresh appointments have to be made. It is important that we remain resolute in our defense of the judiciary at all times. 
Ghana has gained a worldwide reputation for its justice system and legal services. The justice system of which the bar is an integral part is the glue that holds the society together. The decisions of our superior courts are cited in cases in other jurisdictions. Our courts are recognized throughout the world for their excellence, openness to innovation, and willingness to break away from conventions where necessary. For those who cannot come to terms with significant defeats in the courts of law, it ought to be understood that the courts administer justice according to law. The court, as I always say, is not a messy chamber to serve justice based on affection or sympathy. I have stated before that as a tenure, I have not had every ruling on cases contested by me in the courts go in my favor. When rulings adverse to my interests are given against me, I do not go on a rampage attacking the court or releasing press statements to criticize those decisions. I sit back, reflect, dig deep into my legal arsenal, and deploy processes known to the procedural laws of the country to reverse them. On some occasions, I may not even succeed at all, but I live with the decisions and the consequences of them. Indeed, when I look back at certain cases whose outcomes I consider undesirable, regardless of my own views on the questions being judged in them, I come to the conclusion that we have in this country a fiercely independent judiciary in which all of us should take pride that an aggrieved citizen can go to a court of law and challenge anyone, including decisions of the president and parliament, and be confident and be confident that the court will give a decision without fear or favor. I And I refer to recent decisions of the Supreme Court in the Ghana Center for Democratic Development and eight others against the Atenjura, Ezra Manan against the Atenjura, and Professor Apia J. Tutia against the Atenjura. There cannot be a bigger avenue for a lawyer to demonstrate high standards and integrity in society than service in the public sector. Indeed, the historic office of the Atenjura, whose functions are to advise the government impartially, provide counsel to it, prosecute crime in the country, and assist the draft of legislation plays the role of a critical friend to government. On assumption of office, I signal the dispensation whereby the Office of Attorney General zealously protects the interests of the state in litigation, just as private legal practitioners do for their clients, and become the standard bearer in the practice of law. I'm happy to note that through the sound legal advice we give to various ministries, departments, and agencies, we have averted huge judgment debt and spared the nation a lot of agony in other cases. Where cases end up in litigation, the litigating capacity of the Office of Attenjura has been immensely boosted to the point where the state now enjoys tremendous success in most civil litigation, including international arbitration and cases in foreign courts and tribunals. Such is the strength of the capacity of the Office of Attenjura that now memorials, pleadings, and written submissions filed by the office compare favorably with those filed by any lawyer on the international stage, and where the state and the state has been holding its own in most international arbitrations and cases in international courts, and most of the time without the aid of foreign counsel. It is only when the peculiar circumstances of <laughs> indeed it is only when the peculiar circumstances of a matter necessitates that recourse is had to foreign counsel that indeed we do so. Both domestically and internationally, since the last conference, notable successes that have led to a state saving amounts the equivalent of billions of United States dollars from judgment debt have been sought by the Office of the and Ministry of Justice. As part of the process of reform of the Ministry of Justice, I recently authored a letter to the Minister for Finance requesting that he considers paying to my office a small percentage of the amount realized in those cases. This will go a very long way to address the liquidity challenges of the office. And it should be noted that this request does not even cover the huge admin debts that we save, which no one takes note of, but which, of course, runs into billions of US, US dollars. But it's also a request that I'm here to receive a response from the Minister of Finance on. <laughs> My lady, the prosecution division has also ably lived up to its constitutional duty of being the prosecutor of all crimes in the country even though prosecution of so-called high-profile criminal cases is threatened by unjustified delays occasioned by the filing of unnecessary interlocutory applications and various frivolous abuse. The efficiency of a nation's justice system 
is tested by the manner in which cases seeking to hold high profile members of account are conducted. That's unfair for so called high profile criminal cases involving the scheme of mostly causing financial state and money laundering to drag on for years, while similar cases filed against the perceived ordinary members of society are concluded within six months to one year. There is clearly a need for legislative reform, and that is why the Criminal Procedure Amendment Bill. I spoke about earlier on is very, very important. And I request the badge lend its maximum support. On this call too, I'm happy to say that the legislative drafting division of my ministry has been most helpful. Since the last conference, there has been the enactment of some important piece of legislation to strengthen accountability and promote integrity in Ghana. There has been a strengthening of the whistleblower regime by the enactment of an amendment to the, of the Whistleblower Act 2006 at 720 to introduce a reward system for whistleblowers. The new amendment passed by Parliament only about a month ago ensures that 30% of all revenue accruing from cases conducted on the strength of whistleblowers' activity is paid into the fund, and 10% to the income directly generated by the whistleblowers' efforts is paid to a whistleblower. Some time ago, I bemoaned the inimical tendency on the part of public officers to enter into contracts with high rates of interest, especially compound interest. In order to curb this tendency, my ministry has successfully sponsored the enactment of an amendment to a contract act of 1960 at 25 to prohibit the payment of compound interest by the state in transactions entered into on her behalf by public officers. <laughs> Henceforth, it will be unlawful for any public officer to enter into a contract in which the rate of interest is stipulated to be compound interest. The state has had price price will be further protected by this amendment to a contract act. The Minister of Justice is working on a few other important bills as well. I consider the passage of an alternative sentencing act an urgent necessity as a further avenue to reduce congestion in our prisons. A revised draft community sentencing bill prepared by my office is going through a process of validation by stakeholders and will soon be laid before Parliament. When account is taken of the sublime role played by state attorneys as counsel to the Republic, it is necessary that the human resource capacity of personnel of the Minister of Justice be boosted so as to ensure that they deliver first-class world standard service to the nation. In this regard, a partnership between Georgetown University, Washington, D.C., and the Government of Ghana, represented by the attorney general, is executed by my good self in September 2021, seeks to ensure that each year, five lawyers would benefit from postgraduate legal education sponsored by a scholarship jointly funded by Georgetown University and the Scottish Secretariat of Ghana. It is, it is pertinent to indicate that the first batch of five lawyers who profited from this arrangement have returned upon successful completion of their programs. Even though I must hasten to say that with the experience I encountered with the Special Secretariat in terms of delayed payments and incessant complaints by Dortan over persistent failure of the Special Secretariat to pay their portion of the scholarship, I, I find it a little bit reluctant to even proceed with the scheme. In addition to this, State attorneys regularly proceed to pursue various academic courses sponsored by some state institutions relevant to their roles. I cannot conclude this address without emphasizing that there's a need for us to build a world-class legal service in Ghana, working as part of an open global community to resolve modern-day disputes, many of which have cross-border elements. As a profession, we cannot stand still, nor would we want to do so. We need to move with the times, just as the rest of society does. But this does not and should not mean change or innovation for the sake of it. Appeals and disruptions not in tune with the needs of the times are undesirable. The bar is not without its problems. But let us not forget that the law is an endlessly stimulating profession. It is serious and fun at the same time. May God help us to continue to build for Ghana a nation founded on the rule of law, grounded in high standards of integrity and respect for mental human rights. Thank you very much. God bless us all. Thank you, the Honorable Chief Just, uh, sorry, Honorable Attorney General and Minister of Justice. I think I was carried away by the fact that her ladyship's birthday is today. <laughs> at, at this juncture, may I 
humbly invite the birthday celebrant, her ladyship, Justice Gertrude Isaba Saki Tokonu to give us her address and formal opening of the conference. Shall we please welcome her? Thank you very much. Honorable Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Honorable Justices here in present, the National President and other executive members of the Ghana Bar Association, Presidents and executive members of the various regional bar associations, past presidents of the Ghana Bar Association, distinguished members of the Ghana Bar, Nana Osabarima Kwesiata II, Domahini Ogwa Traditional Area, and Ananum Present, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm greatly honored to be with you today. And indeed, I shouldn't have concluded the protocols without adding Mr. Francis Tokonu, my dear husband. <laughs> who graciously offered to follow me today because it's my birthday. <laughs> I'm greatly honored to be with you today. I also thank the leadership of the Ghana Bar Association for the invitation to address this August conference, as well as a warm welcome and the consistent support and cooperation I have received since 12 June 2023, when I was conferred with the responsibility and privilege of being the 15th Chief Justice of the Republic. I am particularly piqued by the many coincidences of today. Cape Coast is a city I was born in, and it is a city I received my foundational education at Wesley Girls High School in. As has already been said, today also happens to be my birthday. Clearly, my times are aligning to assure me that serving the legal community and the people of this country is a call I must give myself wholeheartedly to. So allow me to commence this morning's remarks by reiterating my commitment to give my all and to contribute every leadership skill and essence I have to this role. And this commitment places the commencement and completion of the new High Court in Cape Coast as an extremely high priority. <laughs> I am sure I speak for most of us when I say that from whichever side of the table one stands to sit or stands or sits to study, teach, guide, or administer law, legal processes and proceedings, it is still a great privilege to be part of the community of lawyers, legislators, law professors, and jurists, howsoever designated. The foundational and all-encompassing role that law plays in the creation and weaving of any society makes the legal community critical to the strengths and fortunes of a nation. 
The making of law itself is an innate and primeval function of society because there can be no order without law and there can be no validity without legality. Thus, even in the times of formation of normative structures and characteristics of societies, each human being carries part of the baton that establishes what constitutes law, lawful and proper practice that must pertain in society. Legal theories, therefore, in recognizing the inchoate nature of the primary source of law, have given us principles such as the unfathomable grown norm, the unquestioned moral code, or the often questioned imperial direction of the strongest. Whatever the source of law, we, as legal experts, admit that law forms as human arrangements develop and may only be expanded and refined as society evolves into the shapes of the territory. In this regard, no one person can direct legality without the contribution of other participants of the community. Since law is a collective product of society's projections of will, then it is our critical duty on being given recognition as persons learned in law to ensure that our work produces the much sought after values of justice, fairness, and the rule of law that started the journey of lawmaking. Because it is these end after values that will allow for the strength and stability that provoke the efforts of lawmaking in the first place. Our call is to simply serve the public. Our call is to simply serve our communities. We are required to be the guardians of rights, interpreters of the concept of justice, and advocates for justice for both the strong and the weak, without fear or favor, affection or ill will. This is why the theme for this year's conference is especially heartwarming. Honorable Minister, President of the Bar, distinguished guests, my view is that this high calling of serving the public with tools for interpreting and applying law, demanding rights, and imposition of obligations must be carried out with a deep culture of respect for the principles, edicts, and directions that society has shaped for itself. After all, it is society that fashions law, and it is society that demands the, that determines the standards of study that are accepted in order to be the determiner or administrator of what society then accepts as lawful, valid, and bearers of justice. Whenever we take our eyes off the elements of obligation, opportunity, and privilege inherent in the duties conferred on us and focus on the reward that they bring for discharging our duties, I think that we would then miss the secret ingredient of success because success is when your service is accepted. Since the subject of ensuring high standards and integrity in public life is so broad, like the ancient text captured in John Godfrey Sachs's 19th century poem on the six blind men of India who visited the elephant and recognized parts of the elephant as a whole because of limitations of time and experience in their particular moment. Please allow me to choose fragments of today's broad theme that we can all jointly connect to in this moment for my current remarks. If we recall the poem, the man who touched the elephant's trunk said that this being is like a thick snake. The second who touched the ear decided that the elephant was like a fan. The man who touched the leg said that the elephant is a pillar, just like the tree trunk. The man who touched the side said that the elephant is a wall. The fifth man who felt it still described the elephant as a rope. And the last who felt its task said that the elephant was its spear. 
From where I stand and sit, I would like us to dwell on the ethical values of independence of mind, diligence, and integrity from the broad subject in the, that is the theme of our discussions this morning. We are all aware that clear and high walls of ethical standards for how we must conduct ourselves and deliver our work have been set for us by the 1992 Constitution, the Legal Profession Act, the Legal Professional Conduct and Etiquette Rules 2020 LI 2423, and the Judicial Service Act 2020 Act 1057, inter alia, as well as the various codes of conduct and international instruments, such as the Bangalore Principles of Judicial Conduct 2002 and the Commonwealth the Commonwealth's Latima House principles on the separation of powers of the three branches of government. Therefore, whether we are functioning in the judiciary, in the academia, in parliament, and legislative assemblies, organizations or corporate institutions, including acting within business enterprises, we are surrounded by regulations. So the discussion of standards does not sit within a subjective framework. It sits within objective frameworks and structures. So when we start considering st standards and ethical standards at that, please do not let us think within certain mythical contexts. Let us bring our minds to the laws that bind us. Let us appreciate that there are a whole lot of laws that require us to deliver our work in very ethical models and not without ethical models. Independence of mind demands personal diligence in order to produce well thought out work that can proudly carry our name, our signature, and license number. Commitment to ideals of independent research identity and reputation will guide us to quality of work that, res that responds to the rigors of any form of corporate review and litigation. Diligence supported by personal integrity and attachment to propriety of conduct, compliance with law, and avoidance of criminal conduct will no doubt make the arena of dispute resolution a safe space not just for lawyers, but for the public that we are called to save. A keen appreciation of the necessity of infusing high standards of thought, intellectual depth, and commitment to professionalism will weed out the current high speed of legal processes filed without validity, without care or validity of procedure, or even attention to the jurisdiction of the courts that they are filed in. They will weed out the seeming inordinate and reckless interest in securing orders through perceived procedural shortcuts, such as applications for judicial review that are inundating the courts. They'll definitely weed out the large numbers of addresses and submissions filed in court, which are replete with wrong citations. As a judge, I find the toughest part of my work, the need to check every citation. I think that integrity should compel lawyers to ensure that every citation in the work with their names and their licenses is correct. Please allow me also to say that diligence, integrity, independence of mind and research will also weed out the horror of a public expecting their counsel to be paid fees and to be given extra money ostensibly to bribe court officials and judicial officers. Law has only one function, to build strong, 
harmonious and stable societies. And my earnest appeal is for the legal community to keep this singular goal before us, despite any other differences in functions and roles that we may have. So whether you are functioning from the bar or functioning from the bench or functioning as corporate advisor, let us bear in mind that the purpose of the law is to only build strong, harmonious, and stable society that our children can inherit and nothing else. Despite extensive rules made available for case management, many of our case management practices continue to lead to waste of time and money in court, leaving citizens and investors with a deep sense of frustration with the efficacy of our judicial systems. Inordinate periods of time spent on interlocutory applications and interminable adjournments owing to inefficiency in time and case management in the life cycle of cases have fed into the prevailing perceptions of corruption, which in turn affect confidence in the justice systems of our country. The broader implications of this state of affairs, especially in land litigation, debt recovery, and human rights actions can drive up interest rates and deter investors from our country. It is important to remember that for every case unduly delayed, for every murky piece of legal landscape created, many potential investors are driven away. I am therefore glad to report that strong steps are being taken to assist registrars extensively review their processes from commencement to executions and for gaps in the integrity of the administrative duties to be filled with clear directions. The objective is to ensure that case and time management is done effectively for both citizens and judges so that judges do not wear ropes, citizens do not fuel their cars or pay for transport to get to court to find that out of 20 cases listed for a day, maybe business is done in only three or four. That practice must stop. I cannot close this address without a clear reference to technology. While we must be comfortable with technology and we are engaging technology from e-filing to execution, technological processes, just like manual processes, need to be watched carefully to ensure security, privacy, credibility, and verifiability. It is in this vein that I plead with all of us to move in tandem in the engagement of technology. Where e-justice has not been installed in a court, or e-filing, or e-service, or e-hearing is not being done supported by administrative structures and regulation, it is inappropriate for counsel to scan processes that are to be filed accompanied by mobile money for registrars and court staff to cover court fees and printing costs and to request the said court staff to file or serve the said processes. These practices tamper with the authentication and validation processes needed to support the integrity of court processes. Please remember that the registrars, that we have very few registrars who are lawyers. They themselves hardly know the implication of time on legality. And so when such activities are not supported, you, you, any lawyer may find that you have sent these scanned processes from Accra to Western Region only for your process to be filed out of time and your client then suffers. Embracing technology can help us streamline our work, improve efficiency, and better serve our clients. But like all aspects of law practice, anything done must be supported by regulation and accepted practice 
and rules. Let us bear this in mind, please. I recently encountered a Yoruba proverb, and I hope that the Yorubas among us do not get upset with the way I'm pronouncing it. It says, Asolanki, Kiatoki, and Yam. I'm sure I've done this wrong, but this is, but this is how it is written. And it's supposed to mean we greet dress before we greet its wearer. No matter how privileged we may feel or be as legal experts, this is the only world we will leave to our children and grandchildren. Those who encounter us individually will encounter our society and communities before and after they have met us. They may decide to leave with their investments and not to bother to further engage us, no matter how, no matter our perceived expertise and abilities, if they are unable to sustain safe use of the land we help them buy, or find absolute safety in the properties we register for them, or they are unable to move other cases they get involved in because of the morass of procedural technicalities that they may fall into within the court system. So I pray for your support in all initiatives that I intend to introduce to bring faster and more effective justice to our doorsteps. These initiatives will include deepening the application of technology and e-governance systems to build a fully integrated judicial system that links all levels of court work. Using data for planning monitoring and improvement of the quality of court services. Very broad and sustained capacity building for both the judiciary and judicial service of Ghana. And consistent publications to support the work of courts. Even as the tools with which we prosecute our duties evolve, what remains unshakable is that the age-old values of honesty, integrity, dedication to duty and patriotism will always yield excellent results for those who invoke and engage them. I therefore urge every lawyer to see himself and herself as a necessary partner in safeguarding the integrity of the justice system. May the Lord preserve and protect the Ghana Bar Association as you continue to stretch into excellence. And on this note, I declare this year's Ghana Bar Conference duly opened. Thank you very much. Thank you, Her Ladyship. Shall we now invite the president of the Ghana Bar Association, Mr. Yao Echampon Boafo, to give us his address. Please let welcome him. Her leadership. Gertrude Araba Isaba Sakitokonu, Chief Justice of the Republic, accompanied by the very romantic Mr. Francis Tokon. <laughs> the Right Honorable Godfrey Yabu Adame, Attorney General and Official Leader of the Bar, Osaberima Prisata II. My name for Goa traditional area. Ifunabu Brim Pra Ajinsim, Paramount Chief of the Asin Kushia traditional area. Justice Edward Amwapo Asante, President of the ECOWAS Court of Justice. Justice Duche and Omegacha, retired Justice of the Supreme Court. The, the Judicial Secretary, Superior Court Judges. Members of the Bar Council, past National Secretary and Father of the National President, Honorable S.K. Boafo, Lenny Friends. It gives me great pleasure, and indeed I should, I should feel honored, 
to stand before and address you yet again. Once again, it is another bar conference, and I'm happy to be in your company, and I thank you very much for being present. On behalf of the Ghana Bar Council, and on my own behalf, I warmly welcome all of you present in this august and colorful gathering. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, especially the Chief Justice, who is attending the, this, the Ghana Bar Association Conference for the first time in her capacity as Chief Justice, as we observe the opening ceremony of the 2023 Conference of the GBA at the historic city of Cape Coast. It should be in order for me to express my profound gratitude to the hard-working members of the Council of the GBA, the executives of the Central Region Bar, and others who have tirelessly assisted and cooperated with my executives and I to make this year's conference a reality. It is also in the fitness of things to specially acknowledge and thank the Vice Chancellor and the Council of the University of Cape Coast for opening their doors to us and making their facilities available to us for the purposes of this conference. Thank you for hosting us. This year's bar conference in Cape Coast is obviously in line with the convention of the association to rotate the venue of our annual conference amongst the different regional capitals of our country after last year's conference of the bar in Ho in the Volta region. The decision to decentralize and rotate the hosting of the Ghana Bar Association Conference amongst the different regional capitals is a commendable one. At least, we come to realize that Ghana is not only about Accra. Inherent in that decision is a recognition and celebration of our diversity, an avenue and opportunity to get to know much more about our country and the promotion of, promotion of domestic tourism and contribution to local economics. Cape Coast is a special city and truly historic. Once our nation's capital, but within the legal profession, it is associated with and serves as home to some of the illustrious men and women of the bar and bench. It is not the first conference of the bar in Cape Coast. I remember vividly and with fondness the last bar conference in Cape Coast at, and at the same university in September 2014. A lot has changed since the last time the bar conference was held here. For example, Justice Nene Amegacha was the president of the GB. President Nana Adedanko Kufuado attended the conference as leader of the main opposition, while yours truly was then the Ashanti regional president of the bar. As the president of the Republic will say in Pigeon, levels don't change. <laughs> I believe amongst us gathered here, we can have our unique stories of changes that have taken place in our individual lives and development over the period that we can equally celebrate and be proud of. This year's conference is on the theme, ensuring high standards and integrity in public life, the role of the legal profession. I believe the subject of the conference is very appropriate and comes at an opportune time when there have been many public discussions on the need to improve standards in the delivery of public services and for persons appointed to public offices to act with integrity and decency. Public life, is, public life simply is the opposite of private life. Public life refers to acts, conducts, and expectations of people who have been appointed to or employed in public offices. Such officers or persons work for and are agents of the state and work to deliver public goods and services. In the end, they are accountable to the state and by extension to the people. At its core, the essence of public life is for the office holder or employee to work for the public interest. The essence of public life or public office is that there are appointed persons to whom the resources of state are entrusted. They control, manage, and allocate the resources of the state for the public interest and good with the attendant discretionary powers. For example, they make decisions and execute contracts in the name of the public. That could have, that could have far reaching consequences for those present and even the unborn. As officers of state and trustees of the people, there is an inherent requirement and duty to effectively and efficiently and appropriately use the resources entrusted into their care to ultimately inure to and improve our common good. Yet still, it is acknowledged that inherent in such a public arrangement and management of our resources is the risk for abuse and misuse by such public officers, especially by persons who are unethical, and persons consumed by greed and avarice, 
who end up channeling and using the resources for private and personal gains at the expense of the public good and development and if you, an euphemism for corruption. That brings into focus the need for public officers to uphold and carry out public duties with professionalism, high standards, and integrity. High standards will ensure that right and acceptable practices and processes are not compromised with pile integrity is necessary for the public good, ensuring that the welfare of the state and its people are prioritized and fulfilled over private gains and interest. Integrity may be described as being honest, having strong moral principles, and an unwavering commitment to abide by them. C.S. Lewis says, integrity is doing the right thing, even when no one is watching. It is asked what do public officers do when no one is watching in the comforts of their offices and homes. Integrity is in public life is dear to my heart and should equally resonate with all of us. Integrity in public life will mean that businesses have the chance to compete fairly and competitively and real competences are rewarded. Individuals and entrepreneurs can build and sustain their businesses on merit and not through improper influences or partisan connections. Similarly, appointments and promotions in public service should be based on merit. The issue of integrity in public life and among public office holders is a constant theme. Stories and news of acts of corruption inundate our media platforms almost every day. Ghanaians from diverse backgrounds and endeavors can share the experiences of one form of corruption or the other that, that they have encountered in the public service, be it in filing cases at our courts, in applying for passport and driver's licenses, during the clearing of goods at our ports and harbors, and even in the admission processes at our schools, training colleges, and universities. It is fair to say that our public service and offices are riddled with bribery, embezzlement, and corruption. Procurement breaches are rife, serving a steady flow of questionable wealth for some public offices. Corruption permeates all levels of the public sector and social arrangements. Scandals by public and political and public officers and civil servants are commonplace. There is even the fear that corruption has become normalized. The annual Auditor General's report with its attendant public hearings and the revelations therein, although not new, still make a sad commentary on the state of corruption, plundering, embezzlement, and mismanage of the public, mismanagement of the public purse in this country. We cannot be proud and satisfied with how Ghana has fed on the recent ranking on the Transparency International Corruption Index and the Index of Public Integrity. We cannot continue like this. Things must change. By way of remedial steps, the bar proposes that as a people, we go back to the basics. Let us imbue in our children the cultural and social norms and values and virtues of honest labor, decency, and integrity. Can we stop celebrating and covering up for persons, especially those in the public service, who suddenly become rich and acquire properties without questioning how they come by them. Under Article 35.8 of the Constitution, it is an obligation on the state to eradicate corrupt practices and abuse of power. In that regard, while we acknowledge reasonable efforts in the fight against corruption in recent years, we however hold the view that there is room for improvement. Things could have been better. What about making sure that appointing authorities only appoint men and women of real competence and proven integrity, and not necessarily on grounds of personal preferences or partisan or sectional interests, or on the considerations of patronage, or even by how much financial resources an appointee contributed to the electoral victory? Can we have a system where laws and sanctions for breaches are consistently and fairly enforced, where people in public offices who embezzle resources are dealt with according to law. In that regard, the GBA looks forward to the swift passage of the Conduct of Public Officers Bill, which we believe will ensure and instill a culture of accountability and integrity amongst public officers. We call on government and parliament to prioritize and work closely together in making it a reality. Enough of the lip service. Mr. President, the GBA will remind you of a public undertaking in December 2016, following your election as the fifth president of the Fourth Republic thus. If your goal in coming into government is to enrich yourself, then don't come. Go to the private sector. Public service is going to be exactly that, public service. 
This undertaking gave hope to Ghanaians of the emergence of a new dawn of politics. However, it is our respectful view that several reported corruption-related incidents involving some of your appointees and also amongst some public officers under your administration and the largely lethargic manner with which they are dealt with and even defended and protected leaves a lot to be desired. It must be stressed It must be stressed that as president, the painful truth is that the buck stops with you. It is enough to say that it will be a sad period for our democratic governance if such a public undertaking that gave millions of Ghanaians hope end up as a usual campaign rhetoric by a politi politician. The jury is still out on this one. Mr. President, we will hold you to your undertaking. Please permit me to touch on the raging menace of illegal mining in Ghana. Like a plague that refuses to go away, helped in part by the activities of, of some greedy, lawless and irresponsible Ghanaians, it has succeeded in wrecking an incalculable toll on our forests and water bodies and the livelihoods of thousands of families. The harmful effects of Galamse are all around us. They are ubiquitous for which we cannot gloss over. Lands for the cultivation of staple food and cash crops have been affected. The Pediatric Society of Ghana, in a recent statement by its president, Dr. John A. Apia, has established from studies how, Galam how the Galamse menace is contributing to deaths among children, as well as cognitive defects which affect their school performance and suspected to cause congenital mal mal malformations. Despite the efforts and assurance of government to deal with the menace, there appeared to be a general consensus that not much has been done to effectively and roundly deal with it. The GBA holds the view that a lot more can be done to effectively deal with the menace. That poses a threat to our survival, especially in this period of climate change concerns. We call on government, political leadership, and key stakeholders to show more political will and integrity in decisively dealing with the Galamse menace. This can be done if the real powers behind the Galamse menace are identified and dealt with in accordance with law. Galamse is a capital-intensive illegal activity. The heavy-duty equipment and other machinery and chemicals used in Galamse cannot be afforded and purchased by the young men and women who get arrested on Galamse sites. Entry permits into forest reserves are not granted by such hired hands, and one does not need to possess clairvoyant powers to ascertain that Galamse can only thrive if powerful persons in society are actively funding such menace. The reasonable and irresistible conclusion is that it is controlled and funded by a network of corrupt public officials, politicians, traditional rulers, <laughs> and wealthy and powerful business interests. Indeed, we'll be playing the ostrich with our future if we pretend as we are at the moment. The government must be honest and bold and fish out this evil access of powerful interest, engage in wanton destruction of our environment, and deal with them decisively. <laughs> Irrespective of status, political background of the individuals involved, if we refuse to act, the ravenous gluttony of our elite will completely destroy us as a nation. Social justice is the notion that all citizens must be treated equally, must have equal access to the social amenities and opportunities in the community necessary for their existence and development. In a sense, social justice answers the question, what can we do to ensure that all members of the society, irrespective of their backgrounds, have and enjoy equal human rights and equal access to the opportunities, resources, and wealth of the nation? In simple terms, the presence and application of justice to the citizens irrespective of gender, race, tribe, and economic backgrounds. Within the context of this address, one area of social justice holds very dear to the GBA is the funding for and allocation for the running of the public school system, especially at the basic level and the general quality of education offered within our public school system. 
It is common knowledge that standards have fallen in our public schools despite efforts by successive governments. Our public school system still grapples with issues or challenges such as dilapidated infrastructure, inadequate furniture, and, even, and lack of even late supply of teaching and learning materials. The phenomenon of public pupils learning and being taught under trees, otherwise known as school under trees, unfortunately still so persists. While we commend government for the implementation of the Free SH policy, Free SHS policy since 2017, which has significantly improved access to secondary education in Ghana, the GBA knows with concern the apparent discrimination against basic education. For example, Mr. Kofi Asari of policy think tank Africa Educational Watch, in his analysis of recent budgets, particularly the 2023 budget on education, found that while government's discretionary budget allocation to free SH and TVET for goods and services, as well as for capital expenditure, saw an increment, budgetary allocation to basic and special education for goods and services and CAPEX saw a reduction, revealing inequities in budgetary allocation across the various levels. It is absolutely certain that pupils who attend SITU are from poor and deprived backgrounds. The clear abandonment of the SITU school reinforces the notion that our democratic experiment under the Fourth Republic is becoming one of elite freeloading. An examination of Ghana's education system reveals a public education system that appears to be lopsided in the terms of the fact that while most people generally view busy schools run by the state to be of poor quality, however, the state arguably owns the best secondary schools and universities. It is the view of the GBA that huge investments in infrastructure, for example, in grade A senior high schools, where the children of the elite make up the highest intake, to the detriment of investing in situs, can never be justified and would be retrogressive. <laughs> the chasm that exists between our public schools and that of our public senior high schools should be a blot on our collective conscience as a nation. There must be a change. To that end, the GBA calls on the government to do more for the basic school system, otherwise known as SITO, through increased and adequate funding, an equitable allocation of resources to, the, to help improve teaching and learning, and to address the undeniable infrastructure deficit at that level. It will not, it will not only ensure that our children at the basic level are equipped with the necessary foundational skills for their future, and a seamless transition to also enjoy the free SH policy. But same will be in tandem with the social justice part of the free SHS policy in terms of making public school education accessible to the poor and marginalized in our society. GBA reiterates its call to the government and the state for that matter to make more effective and sustainable steps to ensure the realization of a much more fair and equitable development across the country and across the diverse sectors of the economy and sections of the populace, including more effective policies and measures to tackling unemployment in all forms and bringing real development to the people in the rural areas of our country and thereby dealing with the rural urban drift. Ghana is more than Accra and Kumasi. It is very important for our colleagues who are members of political parties to understand that their primary fidelity is to the legal profession. It is worrisome when members of the Ghana Bar Association itself join the chorus of ignorant partisan populists to denigrate the image of the legal profession and judiciary. Why should we allow politics to divide us? Why should we subject ourselves to the dictates and wishes of politicians and sacrifice the nobility of our profession on the altar of divisive partisan politics. Last year, we were told that unanimous judgments mean that there is no scholarship and independence of thought in judicial reasoning. And in the process, Supreme Court judges were referred to in derogatory terms as unanimous FC. We even had the immediate past Chief Justice being described as the worst Chief Justice ever. And that lawyers of a particular political tradition were discriminated against when they appeared before judges. As if that was not enough, this year, we are being told that the requirement to be appointed to the district court bench, the circuit court bench, the high court, the court of appeal, and the Supreme Court is by being a member of the political party in power, and that this policy will be replicated in the event of a change in government. The natural question to be posed to our overtly partisan colleagues 
applauding such a statement is, in the event that they join the bench at any level during a change in government in the future, how will they feel if people tag them as having been appointed to the Superior Court bench, not because of their knowledge of the law or high level of integrity, but only by reason of just being members of the ruling party? It is instructive to state that, save the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court, when nominations are made by three parties, the government represented by the Attorney General, the Judiciary and the Bar, appointments to the lower court bench and the high court is pursuant to advertisements in dailies inviting persons qualified to apply. There is never a requirement that an applicant has to show his political affiliation. As a member of the Appointments Committee of the Judicial Council, I can say on authority that at no stage of the interview and evaluation process is the political leanings of an applicant required. There is no virtue in sacrificing the legal profession, the judiciary, on the altar of partisan politics. Politicians have their own fair amount of shortcomings in this country already, and we should resist any attempt by them to destroy and tarnish the image of the legal profession and the judiciary. There is no course of study in law known as MPP law, NDC law, or CPP law. For people later in life to proudly describe themselves as MPP lawyers, NDC lawyers, or CPP lawyers. We are all lawyers enrolled on the role of lawyers on the Republic of Ghana. In the same vein, there is no training module at the Judicial Training Institute known as NDC judge, MPP judge, or CPP judge for anyone to tag a judge as an NDC judge, an MPP judge, or CPP judge. There is only one judiciary established under Chapter 11 of the 1992 Constitution. There is an Akan adage which translates as follows. No one points to the direction of his hometown with his left hand. There is nothing to be gained when a group of lawyers allow politicians to use them to denigrate the legal profession and judiciary with its attendant ridicule on social media platforms. It is self-destructive. The toxic and divisive nature of partisan politics in this country is unfortunately being replicated when it comes to discussions relative to matters affecting the legal profession and administration of justice. Our partisan colleagues give active encouragement and support for political hawks to insult and denigrate the leadership of the bar and the judiciary. When such partisan hawks are encouraged by overtly partisan members of the GBA to insult the leadership of the GBA, it is not Yahweh Champon Boafu who suffers. It is not Anthony Fosin Jr. who suffers. It is not Ben Sinduk Chupui who suffers. It is the name of the Ghana Bar Association that is smeared and its reputation lowered. The irony of it all is that these same partisan lawyers have the membership sicker of the GBA proudly emblazoned on the windscreens of their cars. There are doctors, pharmacists, architects, engineers who are card-bearing members of political parties. Yet we never hear of any association known as NDC, MPP Doctors Association, Pharmacy Association, Architects Association, Engineers Association. It is regrettable that the most noble profession rather has associations solely on partisan lines whose modus is always to attack the leadership of the bar and the judiciary at the least opportunity and over mundane matters. The idea of a gathering of lawyers inviting politicians to address them on matters affecting the administration of justice is akin to the national president of GB being invited to speak on Catholic theology at the Catholic Bishops' Conference. It is a grave error. Just so we are all clear, let me state unequivocally that the GBA under my administration is not an appendage of any political party. Neither does it exist to please or even further the cause of any such entity. Any such impression can only be a figment of the imagi imagination. The GBA condemns in, no, condemns in no uncertain terms partisan attacks on the legal profession and the judiciary, and we shall resist with all attempts to foment disaffection against the judiciary and the legal profession. What some of us are doing is akin to cutting out noses only to just spite our fine faces. It is the view of the GBA that although it appreciates the policy rationale behind some of our legislations that impose minimum sentences, however, it is respectfully submitted that the provision for 
that imposition of minimum sentences largely leads to grave injustices on unfair sentence outcomes in most situations. Sometimes it is seen that some minimum sentences are invariably excessively disproportionate to the severity of the offense. For example, a young man or woman trying to survive to put food on the table by selling some few bottles of herbal medicine without a requisite approval from the FDA, mainly because they are too poor to afford the fees for registration and licensing, albeit not justifiable, cannot be as blameworthy and punished the same as a well-established and wealthy entrepreneur or businessman who, although have the means to register at the FDA, simply fails to do so. What are the imposition of a seven-year minimum sentence on a 17 or 18-year-old adolescent boy who has a nonviolent sex with a 15-and-a-half-year-old girl who willingly gave in, even if she statutorily lacked the capacity to have given consent? How is this a fair outcome? It is said that no two cases are the same. Certainly, a poor, hungry, man, hungry young man eking out a living and employed by a rich master and a financier like, as a galamsey side should not be treated the same. Minimum sentences rather judges and magistrates largely helpless, taking away from them the discretion to consider judicial principles in sentences. It also prevents judges the opportunity to consider the peculiarities and nuances of cases, as well as mitigating factors and other circumstances to arrive at a fair, just, and proportionate sentencing. In the end, sentencing becomes mechanical, bereft of any judicial function and scholarship and logic. Last but not the least, with overcrowded prisons, Mandatory sentences only worsen the situation, especially for long sentences. I believe whatever good reasons that were advanced, leading to the abolition of Ghana's death penalty from our statutes, can similarly apply to the repeal or amendment of our minimum sentencing regime. The GBA accordingly <laughs> appeals to the government as per the President and the Honorable Attorney General in Parliament, to seriously consider amending our minimum sentence laws, especially those that impose harsh minimum sentences. Let us give the discretion to our judges. Even if a trial judge should err, our appellate courts can be trusted to review same and ultimately impose the appropriate sentencing. The reform, the reform of our sentencing laws is long overdue. During this year's Father's Day celebration, Members of the neck of the GBA visited the Nsawan prison to donate to the inmates. In engaging officers of the prison service, one was left in no doubt that there was a pressing need to reform our sentencing regime. Mandatory custodial offenses for most petty offenses can no longer be justified. Other forms of sentencing like community service should as a matter of agency be passed into law. Recent events have highlighted and brought to the fore acts of indiscipline and the dangers of the unbridled utterances and use of intemperate language across the various traditional and social media outlets, especially by political activists. Again, there is indiscipline at our schools, especially at our secondary and tertiary levels. There have been stories of vandalism and instances of students physically attacking teachers. There is indiscipline on our roads. Indiscipline is also seen in this age of social media where people hide behind anonymous accounts to attack, insult, and spew lies against others. Indiscipline is also seen in our public discourses. Much as freedom of expression and pluralistic media is guaranteed and protected under the 1992 Constitution, it should not be lost on all of us that attached to such a right is a corresponding even greater deal of responsibility and circumspection. Democracy is not a synonym for chaos and discipline. It is not a byword for anarchy. Democracy and order are not all bedfellows. We therefore cannot hide behind democracy and engage in all manner of indecent and indisciplined behavior. His Royal Majesty Otumfo Osei II Asantehne, in the first democracy lecture, lecture organized by the National Council for Civic Education stated, if you win a people on a diet of scandal, do not be surprised that they have no appetite for good news. It's the start to state that this somber reflection by the Asantehne unfortunately encapsulates the malaise that has affected our media reportage. There is no benefit in self-censorship of the media. However, our situation is not doom, all doom and gloom. We should also report what is good about our nation, our democratic stability, our hospitality, our ingenuity in most fields of endeavor, and not least, the fact that the most beautiful and smartest group of lawyers on planet Earth are female members of the Ghana Bar Association.
The Ghana Bar Association therefore joins the call for more responsibility, decency, restraint and circumspection on our airwaves. The media and the programs they chair now should be healthy ones that promote peaceful coexistence and real talk shop, a marketplace of ideas where opinions and superior alternatives are discussed and exchanged within an atmosphere of civility rather than platforms used as outlets for ventilations of divisions, interpret language and beating of world rounds. We are in the age of digitization and information communication technology. The tangible benefits of ICT in the administration of justice are many, including the expedited case filing and service, efficient management of cases, easily accessible record of proceedings, timely and transparent delivery of justice, and a real reduction in the length and cost of judicial proceedings. Inasmuch as the association acknowledges efforts made in recent years by the government and judiciary to incorporate ICT in its work, we still believe that a lot still needs to be done. For example, it is regrettable that most of our courts, especially those outside Accra, are still not automated. The reality is that in the year 2023, an overwhelming majority of our judges and magistrates still write in longhand, which affects and delays the trial and overall efficient administration of justice in our country. The GBA that supports and calls for more investment in the digitization automation of our courts at all levels across the nation by the state and the judiciary. The bar and bench are the key, stake key stakeholders in the administration of justice. Lawyers are officers of our courts. They exist, in a sense, bonding, binding bonds between the bench and the bar. As a former Chief Justice of India would put it, the bar is the mother of the bench. We are all personaries of an undivided family. The existence and rules of the bench and the bar can thus be said to be supplementary and complementary to each other within the framework of our jurisprudence. That, in my opinion, requires that the bench and bar have and maintain a healthy level of cooperation and cordial relationships. Suffice it to say that it would be a disaster for either the bench or the bar to think and operate as if it can survive and effectively function without the other. There is a need for us to have mutual respect and support for each other. It is why the GBA under my administration is open and committed to deepening the cooperation between the bench and the bar. From my days as National Secretary to my assumption of office as National President, I can only have positive words for the relationship and cooperation that the bar enjoyed from the bench, particularly with the last two Chief Justices, Her Ladyship Sofia Kufu and His Lordship Justice Eni Yaboa. It is fair to say that my administration looks forward to similar cooperation and collaboration with the bench under the current administration of Her Ladyship Chief Justice Gertrude Saki Tokonu. Our doors at the bar are always open. To my cherished members of the bar, let me assure you that my administration will continue to work hard to fulfill the manifesto promises and thematic areas of administration which informed and convinced majority of you to elect me as your president. However, we must take very hard decisions if we have to stay relevant. The GBA of 2023 and beyond cannot operate as the GBA of the 80s and the 90s. We have to modernize the bar. We have to, we have to, we have to be a bar that meets the needs of its ever-growing membership. The demographics of the bar has changed significantly, and change is inevitable if we have to survive. We cannot, we cannot continue on the path that we are treading presently. The biblical injunction that we cannot put new wine in old wine skins and old wine in new wine skins is very apt in our circumstances. At this conference, we'll be discussing the future of the bar and I employ members to take time for us to collectively share ideas on the way forward for the GB. I also wish to encourage you to be diligent, discharge your duties with professionalism and with integrity. Whatever has been said about high standards and integrity expected of public officers equally apply to us. No matter where you offer your professional service and competences, whether in private practice or in public service. In all that we do, please let's have the dignity of the bar in mind. As lawyers who pride ourselves in belonging to the noble profession, we are invariably held to higher standards. There are professional rules and ethics that regulate our conducts and practice. I call on all members of the GB to strictly adhere to the ethics of the profession and to strive to exhibit high standards of professional ethics. In particular, I urge us to be professional, exhibit integrity and demonstrate competence in the discharge of our duties to, the, to our clients, to the court, and to the nation at large. The law should not only be about our excellent grabs of civil and criminal procedure rules or company law or the law of tort principles. Understanding and applying and 
and abiding by the ethics of the profession is equally important for what's a lawyer worth without integrity. As many of us may have found out by now, how you abide by the ethics of the legal profession could either make or break you. You may even get all the wealth at the bar and still lack the respect and regard of your peers and society at large. I can assure you there are many such lawyers around. Please don't let us add to the numbers. Resting statistics from the GLC, especially for someone like myself who has the privilege to be a member, I can tell you in all honesty that it makes a sad commentary on legal ethics in the legal profession. The legal profession should not be a place for persons of questionable characters, persons who engage in acts bordering on moral turpitude, and for persons who engage in sharp practices, which most of the time bring the name of the profession into disrepute. In our profession and the work we do, if our profession and the work we do is to remain relevant and effective and retain the trust and confidence of the average Ghanaian, it must demonstrate or ooze integrity by its practitioners. Truth be told, our moral compass as a nation and as a people have gone amiss in recent times, and there must be an urgent need for a reorientation towards a restoration of our values and principles as a people. The legal profession and its members and practitioners as key proponents of our democracy and conscience of our nationhood, I should believe should lead the way and set the tone in that regard. Suffice it to say, more is expected of us. Let me make a humble call on all Ghanaians, Ghanaians on all walks of life and in whatever endeavor they find themselves, in and across the political and social strata, to be more patriotic into the national cause. We ask Ghanaians to exhibit a renewed and stronger sense of patriotism. Our country, from its struggles for independence and establishment, as well as the freedoms and liberties we enjoy today, is the product and culmination of others who risked and sacrificed their lives selflessly in service to make our nation a better place. We owe it ourselves and posterity to do better. The love for the nation has been replaced by political and partisan considerations. Individual aspirations and interests are pursued at the expense of communal and national interests with disastrous consequences that manifest in greed, corruption, lack of development, destruction to our environment, amongst others. Public service is no longer what it used to be. It appears that for some, Occupying public service is a convenient avenue to plunder public funds and resources into private pockets. At the end of the day, we hurt this nation in unimaginable proportions. Can we be a little more selfless, more hardworking, and exhibit more honesty and integrity in whatever field we find ourselves? Can we be less partisan and be a bit more nationalistic? I believe all hope is not lost. There can be a turnaround. There is still a chance to rekindle the spirit of patriotism and selfless, dedicated service in our people, especially those who occupy public offices. We still have the time, talents, resources, and will to turn back from the political and economic precipice and stand tall in the community of nations. Enough of the excuses and blame games. We have more than enough by way of economic, natural, and human resources than to be at our current state. Let us not be deceived. We have so many challenges and problems as a nation that cry out for constructive solutions. Let us take our destiny into our hands. The history of our nation shows that we are capable in turning our fortunes around. Let us harness the wisdom and experience of the old and the exuberance and industry of the youth to fully and ultimately unlock our potentials, putting us on the path of sustainable growth and prosperity. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I wish to bring the curtains down on my address by thanking you all for attendance and attention this morning and your participation at this year's bar conference. I wish all of us an enjoyable and fruitful conference. Thank you very much. May God bless us all. Thank you, Mr. President. I need not say more because the actions of the lawyers you lead says it all. At this juncture, may I humbly acknowledge the presence of some important personalities 
in our midst. Shall we kindly acknowledge the presence of Her Ladyship, the Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana, Her Ladyship Justice Gertrude Isabasaki Tokoni. There is a saying that behind every successful man is a woman. I believe that the opposite is also true. That be behind every successful woman is a man. And we are equally privileged to have in our midst Mr. Fr Francis Tokonu. <laughs> Shall we also acknowledge the presence of the Honorable Attorney General and Minister of Justice and the official leader of the bar, <laughs> Godfrey Yabu Adame. Shall we also acknowledge the presence of the National President of the Ghana Bar Association, Mr. Yaochan Pombuafu. <laughs> we had the Vice Chancellor of University of Cape Coast. He was on the high table, but I believe he has to attend to some equally important assignment for which he has left. He was in the person of Professor Johnson Nyako Bwampong. I'm reliably informed that the registrar of the University of Cape Coast is around. Shall we kindly acknowledge the presence of Mr. Jeff Tei Unyame? We are also privileged to have in our midst the Controller General of Ghana Immigration Service, Mr. Kwame Techi. We also have in our midst DSP Rubin Asamoa Fenyi, who is the prisons, the leader of the prison service. The regional, thank you. We have ACP Mr. Charles Kofi Edu, who is the regional commander of police. Okay, he's not here. Shall we also acknowledge the presence of the Deputy Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Mr. Alfred Tuyeboa, who is one of our own? Shall we humbly acknowledge the presence of retired Justice of the Supreme Court of Ghana, Justice Jones Maulon Duche? He is the speaker for our conference team tomorrow. <laughs> Shall we also acknowledge the presence of retired justice of the Supreme Court of Ghana and past president of the Ghana Bar Association, His Lordship Justice Nene Amegache. Shall we also acknowledge the presence of the President of ECOWAS Court, Justice Edward Asante. <laughs> Shall we also acknowledge the presence of the Judicial Secretary, Her Ladyship Justice Cynthia Pamela Adu. <laughs> Shall we also acknowledge the presence of High Court Justices in our midst. Kindly give us a wave. <laughs> Shall we also acknowledge the presence of judges and magistrates in our midst? Kindly give us a wave. <laughs> now may I humbly request that 
we also acknowledge the presence of the person who gave us his blessings and also gave us the permission to enter his land. I'm talking about the Omaihini of Ogwa traditional area of Saberima Kusiata. <laughs> Shall we also acknowledge the presence of the chief of Asin Kushia, the, sorry, the Omaihini of Asin Kushia, and he's in the person of Nana Pra Ajinsem. <laughs> We also have in our midst Osajifu Amanfu Edu Desis, the Omaihene of Mankasim traditional area, representing Odefo Amwakwa Abuadu the Eighth, the Paramount Chief of Berman traditional area, and the President of the Central Regional House of Chiefs. <laughs> Shall we also acknowledge the presence of Nana Amba, a Yaba, Queen Mother of Efutu, Cape Coast? <laughs> Shall we also acknowledge the presence of Nana Kujo Kundria, the fourth, sorry, the sixth, who is the Omanhene of Edna traditional area? <laughs> so here, uh, Shall we also acknowledge the presence of the former Ashanti Regional Minister, the former Minister for Chieftaincy Affairs, and the Chairman of the National, sorry, the Minerals Commission, and who also happens to be a former Secretary of the Ghana Bar Association, and as I always say, he is the father of our President, Mr. S.K. Buafu. Shall we acknowledge him? We also have here uh, national executives of the Ghana Bar Association kindly give us a wave. Thank you. And we have members of the Bar Council kindly give us a wave. We also have in our midst the Chief Executive Officer or the Chief Executive yes, Officer of Qua Research and Manufacturing Company Limited. Thank you so much. He assisted us, or he assisted the local bar in organizing this conference, and I'm also told that he's also assisting the, the bar, the central bar, to acquire their own regional office. Shall we kindly take these few announcements? There will be legal outreach this afternoon to some selected schools in this region. Members who are interested to join should kindly see Daniel Arthur, who is the secretary of the Central Bar. There has also been a change in venue for this evening's cocktail. We are going to have the cocktail at the forecourt of the Vice Chancellor's residence. Directional signs have been uh, posted, uh, which will direct members to the place, and Google Map will also be shared on our uh, platforms. May I remind members that it is speedily by 
the entry will be restricted to those with conference tax. And if you do not have one, kindly do not venture because the police may deny you entry. Tomorrow, we are going to have a conference team and CLE sessions. And it will not take place as originally announced, but it will rather take place in this auditorium. So let us all kindly take note of that. May I now invite the Central Bar Secretary to give us some other announcements regarding our lunch. Mr. President, Honorable Attorney General, Her Ladyship the Chief Justice, all protocols observed, please kindly let's make way for the following announcements. The lunch will be had at the car park of the neck, just in front of us, as, as soon as you exit we have arranged the place where the canopies are, have been erected. That is where the lunch will be had. And the DVLA has also set their stand at the right side of the neck where they are performing all services. So they are giving us all their services, including renewal of licenses and roadworthy certificates. <laughs> DVLA, yes. So if your license has expired, they are going to renew it for you. <laughs> yes, driving license, with respect, driving license and roadworthy certificates. Yes, medical screening is also ongoing at CA Aka Lecture Theater, the building that overlooks NEC at the basement. They have also started, so anyone who is ready can walk in and start the screening. Please, the legal outreach will also come off immediately after lunch. We are converging at 2.30 in front of NEC, where a shuttle will be made available to take interested participants to the various schools. And we have also circulated the list of schools and if you are interested, which school you may choose to go and have the legal outreach. The cocktail party, as in the evening, as has been said by the National Secretary, will be at the VC launch, UCC. And we will also send to you the various locations as and when the program is about to start. So these are the few announcements left. Others will be communicated through your portals and on the internet. Thank you very much. May I humbly invite Dr. Kasimu Isao, Chief Imam of University of Cape Coast and Senior Lecturer at the Department of Marketing School of Business to give us the closing prayer. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the lord of everything we seek forgiveness from you and we repent to you these are your instance that everything end in success O oh Allah we ask you for beneficial knowledge we ask you for pure sustenance and grant us the knowledge, the wisdom, and power to be able to engage in work that are acceptable by you. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna kanta samu dua. Wa tuba alayna ya maulana inna kanta tuabu rahim. Subhanak wa bihamdik wa nashad Allah ilaha illa anta nastakfiruk wa natubu ilayh.
سبحان ربك رب العزة ما يفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين ربنا تقبل منا أو الله أسد from us آمين Okay, thank you. Before the high table leaves, would we'll, um, take some few group photographs with her ladyship. And since today is her birthday, I, I think that uh, it would be proper to take those photographs. Now, may I humbly ask that after the photographs, the members of the high table would exit, after which NEC and, and Supreme Court judges and council members will follow, then all follow um, to where we are going to have the lunch. <laughs>